This presentation on an overview of QTL analysis is sponsored by the Tools for Genomics Assisted Breeding and Polyploids Training Workshop and funded by NEFA, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture within the USDA Specialty Crop Research Initiative and was held on January 15, 2021. So, yes, thanks, Dave. My name is uh, Chris Malipart. I'm from Wageningen University Plant Breeding, and this work is mostly together with Peter and Ruland, but with a larger group as well. And we call ourselves sometimes uh, Polyploids Un United. I will start with uh, the situation in uh, diploids and then later move to uh, polyploids. And I've tried to keep it quite basic, so bear with me for that. Um, so what is a QTL, quantitative trait locus? The definition that I use often is that it is a region on a linkage group that shows a statistical association with a quantitative phenotypic trait. Now, yesterday the question came up whether we could uh, use the approach also for qualitative phenotypic traits, and indeed we can, but it's not the other way around. Uh, the issue is that if you have a qualitative traits, then sometimes it's possible to map it as if it was a marker, so using the tools that we learned about yesterday. But for that situation, the trait has to be monogenic, nice Mendelian inheritance. It shouldn't have too much environmental variation to the trait, and you should be able to score it without error, basically. Well, the... oh, sorry. But for most traits that breeders work with, this is not the case. So we need some other tools as well. And that's what we will be talking about here. So what we are looking for is to find situations where we find an association between um, a region on a linkage group represented by markers and a phenotypic trait. And this could be such a situation. So we have some marker. This is a plot for just one marker. And we have a number of individuals in a mapping population, for example, a doubled haploid population or uh, a real population, where we have only two genotypes for the marker. They are denoted with A and B here. And what we do is we group the individuals in the progeny according to their marker genotype. So we group the A individuals and we group the B individuals, and we calculate the mean for the phenotypic trait across those two groups of individuals. And if we see a statistically significant difference like, we, difference like we do over here, then we conclude that there is a QTL in the vicinity of this particular marker. However, there will be lots of markers for which you don't see any difference at all between the means. So that means that those markers are not linked or maybe distantly linked to um, to any QTL. So what do we need for a QTL analysis? We need a segregating population that segregates both for the markers and also for the uh, phenotypic traits. And in selfing diploids, this could be a backcross population or an F2 or double haploids or uh, recombinant inbred lines. Um, for outcrossing diploids, we often use the direct F1 of a cross between two heterozygous parents. And that's also, also what we see in most polyploid crops. So we often use in our projects the direct F1 of a cross between two uh, parents. But as we discussed also yesterday, it would also be possible to have uh, an F2 in selfing polyploids or other selfing populations. The other thing we need is a statistical model or a test uh, procedure. Now, I will talk about different um, approaches to mapping QTLs and start with the most obvious and simple one to use single marker QTL analyses. Uh, for that situation, you don't need a map, but it's still very useful to have it. Wow. Then I will go over to interval mapping, where we do need a map. Somebody needs to mute their mic, I think. Yep. So then I will move to interval mapping. And finally, I will talk a little bit about uh, an analysis uh, where we have models with multiple QTLs, not a single QTL model. 
So the single marker test could in its most simple form just be a t-test or an ANOVA or a regression analysis per single marker. It could also be a non-parametric test based on the ranks of the phenotype like um, uh, Crosco Wallace, which is not so sensitive to outliers and to other assumptions such as uh, normality. There you would use only the order of the phenotypic scores and not their actual values. And what we are looking for is a situation such as this, where we again group the um, phenotypic trait according to the marker genotype, and we look for a significant difference between the groups. In this case, we have only two groups and we see a difference between these two groups. And we do this not just for a single marker, of course, but for every marker that we have uh, on our genome. The result could be something like this. I'm plotting just one linkage group uh, over here. So we see the results of the tests per single marker. We plot the significance at the marker against the map position in Centimorgan, here for just one linkage group. And here the dots are connected by uh, straight lines, but actually we don't have any information in between the markers. So we only have the information at the marker positions themselves. And in this particular case, we see five markers that show a significant difference between the means in the phenotype and still this is evidence of only a single QTL because we see that these five markers are closely linked on the same linkage group. And therefore it's indeed useful to have the linkage map. Otherwise we would not, not know this maybe. So for that situation, we would expect significance for markers that are relatively close to the QTL. If the marker is not at the same position as a QTL, so in the situation that there is recombination possible between the marker and the QTL, it means that we will get biased estimates of the QTL effects, and also we will have a lower power to detect the QTL. And it's good to think about power of QTL analysis. So with a larger distance from the marker to the QTL, the power goes down. So that means we need a high density of the markers. The power also goes down when the, the true effects of the QTL are smaller. Of course, then they are more difficult to detect. Also when the population is smaller or when it's very difficult to do the phenotyping, so you have low accuracy in the phenotyping, or when you have larger experimental variation, if you cannot account for that variation. And another thing to consider is that if we have some big QTLs segregating, they also cause a lot of, in this case, genetic variation that makes it difficult to, uh, to find other QTLs. So in the presence of already detected QTLs, the power goes down for some smaller QTLs. So the next approach that I want to talk about is uh, interval mapping. And this solves some of the issues from uh, single marker analyses. What we do in interval mapping is we don't consider only the marker positions themselves, but also the positions in between the markers. And you could look at it in this way that we actually pretend that we have markers in between the real markers. So here in orange, we have the, the true markers and in yellow, we have the positions at which we also want to test for a QTL, but we don't have markers there but we just pretend that we would have markers there. And how do we do that? Because we have uh, markers on both sides of that position, we now translate map distances back into recombination frequencies. And with these recombination frequencies, we can estimate the probabilities of the genotypes in any position between the two markers. So we do the opposite from what we did yesterday. Yesterday, we translated recombination frequencies into map distances. Here we translate the distances back into recombination frequencies and then into genotype probabilities for all the individuals in our uh, population. So we would have the probabilities of the genotypes in between the two markers. And 
with those probabilities, we can make a model as if we were at the marker position. And the model could look some like, uh, like this uh, in, for example, in a regression approach in NF2. We have some overall mean. We have a dummy variable that depends just on the probability of a homozygous genotype, either the one homozygote or the other homozygote at that position. And another parameter that quantifies the probability of having a heterozygous genotype at that position between the markers and a statistical error. Now in the F2, we have three genotypes. And in this model, we have only two effects that we estimate. The additive effect of the QTL, that's half of the difference between the two homozygotes. And the dominance effect of the QTL, that's the difference between the heterozygote and the, the middle of the two homozygotes. The advantages of uh, using this approach of interval mapping is that we now can visualize the evidence of a QTL over the whole uh, linkage group. So not just at the marker positions. And we can identify the probable regions of the QTL in that way. Also, we will get less bias in the estimated QTL effects because we, are not, um, we don't have the problem of recombination between the position and the um, proposed uh, QTL position. It gives us higher power than a single marker analysis, and it allows us to distinguish multiple QTLs on the same uh, chromosome. And the result is something that will look familiar to you, a plot such as this one, where we plot the significance um, against the map positions. And then we see, uh, hopefully, some peaks that indicate uh, QTLs. We also see a very nice, smooth curve along the linkage group over here. And that's because we now can test uh, the significance at, say, every centimorgan of this uh, linkage group. Now, in interval mapping, actually, two different approaches are used. And they come down to the same thing, but they use different type of um, uh, numerical approaches and modeling. And the second one I want to show as well, because um, we often use the test statistic from that particular approach, and that's a maximum likelihood approach. In the maximum likelihood approach, we build a probability model for the observations, the phenotypic observations that we have in our populations. And then we are going to compare two likelihoods with each other. And the first likelihood, we be, would be assuming that there is a QTL at that particular position. The other model is under the assumption of having no QTL at that position. And we could visualize it like this. I hope it's a bit uh, visible here. So we look at the observed phenotypic data, and that's depicted here in the histogram. So those are our real phenotypic observations. And then we're going to fit these two models. In the situation that there is a QTL, we assume that the QTL genotypes have each a different distribution, distinguishable from each other. So that would be the green fitted distributions here. So we would have a mixture, in this case, of two distributions, each corresponding to a different QTL genotype. And we fit that model to the observations that we have, and we calculate a likelihood for that mixture model. Then we do it again, but we assume now that there is no QTL at that position, so we fit only a single distribution. We don't have a mixture, we only have a single distribution. So that's the red curve in this plot. Again, we calculate the likelihood of the observations given that particular model, and then we just compare these two likelihoods with each other. And in this case, it's quite obvious. We see that the green um, mixture distribution follows much more closely the histogram than the red curve does. And that will be quantified in the likelihoods. So we have these two likelihoods, the likelihood of having, yes, a QTL, where we have to fit two means for every of the two distribution, we have a different mean, and the likelihood of the data under the assumption of no QTL at the position where we have only a single mean. We calculate the likelihood ratio, and we take the 10 log of this likelihood ratio, and that gives us the lot score. 
And this is the lot score for the presence of a QTL at the test position. Now the interpretation of the lot score, it's a 10 log. So um, we know that 10 to the power three um, means a thousand. So the 10 log of a thousand is three. So a lot of three in this case would mean that the likelihood of the data, uh, assuming that there is a QTL is a thousand times larger than the likelihood of the data, assuming no QTL. If there is no QTL, we would expect lot scores that are close to zero. But in practice, they can go up quite a bit from zero. So we really have to estimate uh, a suitable uh, threshold. I will talk about that in a minute. Now, another thing to consider that this lot score is not the same lot score as the lot that we use in linkage analysis. So for linkage of a pair of markers where we don't look at the phenotype at all. That was just the 10 log of the likelihood of the recombination frequency estimate versus the likelihood of two unlinked markers. So this is a different lot score. And again, we get a nice smooth plot where we have the lot score on the y axis plotted against the map position on the uh, x axis. And because we do interval mapping here also, we have the test statistic at every possible position that we want. Now, as I mentioned before, it could still be an issue that these models are actually single QTL models. So they don't account in the modeling itself for multiple QTLs. But in reality, we could expect that for a lot of quantitative traits, that these traits are not determined just by a single QTL, but by multiple QTLs. So it could be that we have actually low power if we assume just a single QTL model and don't account for multiple QTLs. So let's see if we can do that as well. I will not go into that very deeply, but what we can do is to use marker cofactors at the positions that we already have or uh, mapped a QTL. So at the positions where we have a peak in the lot score, we use markers as cofactors in the model and these cofactors then would absorb the effect of the QTLs at that position. And by doing that, actually correcting for these QTL effects when um, fitting a model, trying to look for other QTLs. Then the issue is, of course, how to choose these cofactors. Well, first of all, there should not be too many, and they should represent potential QTLs. And um, we often use a kind of pragmatic uh, approach, uh, starting with a user-defined set. So we select, for example, the um, amount significance thresholds, and we choose cofactors at the peaks that are above that threshold. And then we remove cofactors by a backward elimination approach, um, trying to get rid of those cofactors that really don't contribute much to um, the model. And then we redo the QTL analysis, including the remaining cofactors, and that's theoretically would give us extra power, especially if you have some QTLs with big effects, uh, correcting for these QTLs could give a better uh, insight in the remaining QTLs that there still are. So it would allow you to uh, detect additional QTLs. Then I still mentioned that there is an issue with uh, choosing uh, significance uh, thresholds, in this case for the lot score, for example. And um, in statistics, we would often use uh, a defined uh, model to choose such a threshold, for example, a normal distribution. Here, we often don't do that because we don't want to make such strong assumptions about the um, uh, distribution of our phenotype. So the approach that is often taken is a permutation approach. And how does that work? We take our quantitative traits in the population in which we have measured the traits. And then we create a lot of random orders of the individuals for that phenotypic trait. And we do that lots and lots of times, for example, 10,000 times. So we are reshuffling the phenotype 
but we keep the marker data the same as, as it was. So the order of the individuals is the same as in the original data sets for the marker genotypes, but it is changed for the phenotypic traits. And by doing that, we are destroying the, the relationship that there was between the markers and the traits. And by doing that, we are actually creating a situation where we don't have a QTL. So we are in the situation of the null hypothesis. There is no QTL for this particular trait. Then we run the analysis as if this was our true uh, phenotype and we make the lot score graphs and we note down all the lot scores and we take the maximum lot score over the genome. And we do that in each of our simulations. So we get a distribution of these maximum lot scores across all the permutations that we did. And because this represents the distribution of the lot score in the situation that there is no QTL, we can determine our thresholds from that distribution. For example, by taking the 95 percentile from these um, maximum lot scores. And that will give us a genome-wide lot threshold for our QTL analysis. Now I want to move over to the situation in uh, polyploids. So we could have different um, plody levels, tetraploids, hexaploids, triploids, pentaploids. But we use quite similar principles as we used uh, before. However, we have to account for a number of extra features. So, and we have seen actually already these uh, features in um, the previous days. So the first thing is to, that we have to account for more dosage classes in a polyploid than in a diploid. In a diploid, we could have um, a highest dosage of two. In a triploid, we have, would have the dosages zero to three, in a tetraploid zero to four, and a hexaploid zero to six. We also have to account for different possibilities of the QTL segregation type. And I've listed a number of possibilities. So for example, um, a favorable QTL allele could be present in simplex in one of the parents. So the favorable allele here indicated with the big Q is only present in a single copy and also in only one of the parents, the first situation. It could also be that it's present in duplex in that parents. So we would have a duplex by, by nulliplex uh, segregation for the QTL. Or it could be present in simplex, the favorable QTL allele in both parents. So simplex by simplex situation. Then we also have to consider the different homologs per parent. So we have to consider that the QTL, the favorable QTL allele could be on the first homolog, but it could also be on the second homolog, the third homolog, et cetera. In the QTL analysis, we also need to consider uh, whether the pairing of the chromosomes in the meiosis is as bivalence or as multivalent. So under um, um, bivalent pairing or under multivalent pairing. So can we have crossovers just between uh, two of the homologs or could we have crossovers between more than two of the homologs? And then we also have to consider more gene action models just because we are dealing with more alleles at the same locus. So not just additivity or simplex dominance as we saw in the diploid case. And maybe we want to consider the possibility that there is more than one functional allele at the locus. So we have a multi-allelic QTL. So the first thing we need for QTL analysis in a polyploid is um, a polyploid linkage map as we were constructing yesterday. And that means that we don't only need the integrated map, but we also need the phased linkage groups of each of the individual homologs. So we really need the assignment of the marker alleles to the individual homologs as is indicated here in the red for the maternal homologs and in blue for the paternal homologs for a tetraploid. In this case, this is a rose linkage group two.
Then we need the probabilities, uh, the IBD probabilities for every individual in the population and at every locus. So what has been inherited exactly in terms of the homologs from the parents to the progeny individuals. And this is something we obtain during the mapping. We can get it from uh, Tetra Origin, um, the software of uh, Shaozi that we saw yesterday. And also uh, we get that from an approach in PolyQTL R. Both approaches are actually possible in PolyQTL R. And these identity by descent uh, probabilities are a more complete representation of the genotypes um, in our population. And we would have them for every uh, position in the genome. That's visualized over here. Uh, this is a picture similar to what I think both Jeff and Peter also showed uh, yesterday. So here we have a number of uh, individuals in the population. And this is in a, a tetraploid cross. And we have the homologs um, on the y-axis. Uh, one to four for parent one, five to eight for parent two. And for each individual, and at every position of this particular linkage group, we have the probabilities for that homolog to be inherited by this individual from, well, from the mother for homolog one to four and from the father for homolog five to eight. And here that looks actually pretty uh, good with dark blue at most positions um, along this uh, linkage group. We also see, as we saw yesterday, evidence of uh, double reduction, the red, um, the red portions here where we have only um, one homologue that seems to be transmitted from the parent to the progeny individual. So probably in a double copy then. And then these IBD probabilities are used in a statistical model again, only we have um, a couple more parameters than we had in the diploid case. And here we have dummy variables indicating the inheritance of a particular homolog from a particular parent, but with one um, important limitation. We cannot have all four homologs from parent one and all four homologs from parent two because um, these probabilities would not be independent of each other. If we know three of the probabilities, we also know the fourth from a particular parent. So we only have three indicator variables for the homologs from parent one and three indicator variables from the homologs of parent two. So for uh, a tetraploid, we would have six parameters that we have to uh, estimate. That also means, well, that's also that's not so very different in a diploid that the effects are actually estimated relative to each other. So we're estimating contrasts rather than absolute effects. And then we have to assess the significance again at that particular position for this uh, model. And um, for that, we look at the Bayesian information criterion and we also use it to compare different uh, QTL models. So for example, a model with only additive effects or uh, a model with dominance effects. And post mapping, we also look at uh, a visualization of the homolog effect because we want to see um, which homolog contributes, well, positive or negative effects to a particular individual. I will give an example here. This is from a data set that Peter will also be using in the workshop after this. Um, it's a rose data set. And here the phenotype was the number of prickles on uh, a portion of the stem. And we see a lot score graph for linkage group three in this particular case. And we see a QTL peak on that uh, chromosome at the beginning of this uh, linkage group. And we visualize the contribution of the homologs to um, the trait value. And here we see that for this particular example, uh, a positive contribution of the number of prickles in blue for homolog three. So this is a homolog from parent one. And you remember maybe the 
marriage between the the prickly mother and the smooth father that uh, Peter talked about yesterday. So this is an effect from homolog three of the prickly mother uh, contributed to um, the progeny. And the values are indicated in the legend. And here it's a QTL with a relatively uh, minor effect of, well, say, uh, one extra, extra prickle, or maybe a bit more. Here's another example. Uh, this is an example of chrysanthemum from a paper that um, Geert van Geest wrote uh, with Peter and others, where they looked at uh, flower color in a chrysanthemum mapping population. And here, Peter compared uh, two approaches using the IBD probabilities, either using the very nice um, hidden Markov model from um, uh, the IBD probabilities and a quick and dirty heuristic approach that Peter had actually developed during his um, period as a master's uh, student in his master's thesis. And um, the quick and dirty method here is shown in uh, orange, but you see that for this particular instant, it, the approximation is actually very good. We see kind of the same uh, lot score profile uh, that we also see for the, um, the more exact methods. Then, ah yeah, uh, there's another issue here because we see two very clear uh, QTL peaks on linkage groups five and uh, seven. And we see kind of a minor peak at uh, linkage group nine over here that just reaches the significance thresholds. And as I mentioned before, it could be that uh, power to detect that third QTL could be a bit low because of those two bigger QTLs that are segregating on linkage group five and seven. So Peter also uh, looked at a situation where he had cofactors uh, near the QTL peaks on chromosomes five and seven, and then redid the analysis, including these two uh, cofactors. And the result is shown over here. So now we have um, in the purple two cofactors on linkage groups five and uh, seven near the QTL peaks. And because these cofactors now absorb the explained variance from those two linkage groups. In purple, we see a lot score of zero or near zero at the two uh, positions that previously had this enormous peak. And the idea was that maybe the peak on chromosome nine would become much clearer. Here it actually doesn't. So it doesn't become much lower. It also doesn't become much um, higher by including the marker cofactors on uh, linkage groups five and uh, seven. But it could actually happen. So it could actually be become much uh, clearer. Then a final thing maybe that I should uh, mention is we talked about uh, the possibility because all these um, things that I now showed, they were all under the assumption of um, bivalent pairing in the meiosis. So we were wondering, does it go terribly wrong if we also have multivalence in um, in the meiosis. And that's something that uh, Peter investigated in uh, a paper that has, a, that has appeared in G3 in 2019, uh, together with Christine uh, Hackett. So uh, he looked at simulations um, with different amounts of um, multivalence uh, in the meiosis, and then did the analysis um, assuming that there were multivalence and also assuming just the bivalent model. And what he shows in that paper that you really need to have a very large and maybe unrealistically large number of multivalence before it starts to, um, to impact the analysis very much. So um, for common situations, that's not a very big gain in power if you um, allow for multivalent pairing. And actually the interpretation and the model fitting works much better in this uh, bivalent uh, context. So that is what we tend to do. So conclusions, perspectives, 
um, these IBD based analyses provides um, a possibility for powerful QTL detection in polyploid uh, populations. So it actually extends the framework from diploids to polyploids very nicely. Something that I didn't show, but that Peter maybe will show in the workshop is that it is useful to have knowledge about the genetic information content, which is related to the distribution um, of the markers over the homologs. And this genetic information content could point out to you whether there are experimental uh, deficiencies uh, in your experiments. And then the question, of course, is how to use these approaches in uh, practical breeding. And I'm sure that in the course of this uh, project that will become one of the more important uh, issues to, uh, to tackle. How are we going to use the tools, first of all, to detect QTLs? And once we have them, how are we going to uh, deal with them in a practical breeding situation? And with that, I want to finish. Um, but with a lot of uh, acknowledgements, so um, Peter especially, I also uh, nicked some slides from Peter for this presentation. Uh, Roland, of course, uh, some other people that have contributed uh, work to, um, uh, to this and um, the project and the project partners that were involved in um, the polyploid projects that we have been running in uh, Wageningen. So this was together with a lot of companies that provided also data sets for um, different crops. So that's it for this brief introduction. This presentation has been sponsored by the Tools for Genomics Assisted Breeding and Polyploids Research Project. For more information, you can email us at toolsforpolyploids at tamu.edu or visit our website at www.polyploids.org. This project is funded by NEFA within the USDA Specialty Crop Research Initiative Funding Program.